A mysterious woman lures a businessman across state lines with the promise of a lucrative deal. When he vanishes, authorities turn to the FBI for help. Suspicions point to a bitter business rival, but the suspect stonewalls investigators. Agents would use state-of-the-art technology to find friends and lovers who might be willing to reveal the truth. A wealthy businessman went to Florida to make one last deal before he retired, but he never returned home to his millions. Authorities examined who was closest to the victim and who stood to gain from his disappearance. But this time, conventional rules did not apply. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. In a case that spanned the entire East Coast, agents would have to untangle a web of sex, money, and vengeance that led to murder. Newark International Airport in New Jersey. On Saturday, February 24, 1996, Kiwi Airlines Flight 45 took off for West Palm Beach, Florida. 58-year-old Frank Black was on board. Black owned and operated a successful school bus and transportation company in Andover, New Jersey. Thank you. He had made millions and was on his way to Florida to meet a new industry contact. Black told his family and co-workers he would be home Monday in time for another meeting. He also told them that his contact in Florida, a woman named Mia Giordano, was to pick him up at the airport. She would take him to meet others involved in the lucrative business deal. Privately, Black hoped to retire after closing the deal. When Black failed to return on Monday, his family contacted the New Jersey State Police. Detective Sergeant Lee Liddy was one of the state detectives assigned the missing persons case. He was the kind of guy that he would always phone home. He always wanted to know what was going on with his business. He was a hands-on type of guy. Without Frank, the business really didn't run. And that's why they were concerned when they didn't hear from him. All of a sudden, he disappeared because Frank wasn't the kind of guy who would just walk away from his business. New Jersey investigators interviewed Black's daughter, Leanna, and his girlfriend and office manager, Sally Roberts. Leanna said her father had missed an important meeting with her to discuss the sale of his business. He also had not answered calls to his cell phone. Sally Roberts recalled that the woman from Florida, Mia Giordano, had phoned the office many times recently but never left her number. The Florida woman claimed to represent a company named Valdez Exporting. Giordano provided a description of herself so Black could recognize her at the airport. She said she was five foot one and blonde. A detective visited the travel agent who booked Black's trip. The agent confirmed that Black purchased a one-way ticket to Florida. He didn't bother to rent a car since his contact had arranged to pick him up. Airline records corroborated that Black had boarded the flight. But he had not registered at any hotels upon his arrival in West Palm Beach. An examination of Black's records revealed that his credit cards had been used after his arrival in Florida. 
To follow the credit card trail, New Jersey detectives contacted the Fort Pierce office of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. FDLE Special Agent Michael Driscoll was assigned the case. Frank Black's credit card was used at the embassy suites in Riviera Beach between approximately 1 in the morning and 2 in the morning. Okay, now we're talking about from February 24th into February 25th. And then at 4 o'clock in the morning, his credit card, a different credit card, but his, Frank Black's credit card was used to purchase gas at a gasoline station in North Miami. To investigators, this seemed odd since he hadn't rented a car. The state agent interviewed the employee who had worked on February 25th. When shown a photo of Black, the attendant said he didn't recognize him. The station's pumps all had credit card slots. No one would have had contact with Black or whoever was using his credit card. The employee didn't recall seeing anyone fitting Mia Giordano's description. Driscoll contacted the Florida Secretary of State Corporation Division to get an address for Valdez exporting. Mia Giordano's company. Okay. Catch you later. Bye. He found no such company registered in the state. He also attempted to locate Mia Giordano herself. We did a very extensive search to identify any Mia Giordano in Florida, and we couldn't find any, I believe, any Mia Giordanos in Florida, or any that would even come remotely close. And we checked Florida as well as New Jersey and with negative results. On March 1st, a detective from the New Jersey State Police traveled to Florida where Frank Black's trail ended. Nobody had heard from Black in five days. Detectives now believe the millionaire had met with foul play. Their most likely suspect, a woman calling herself Mia Giordano, was untraceable. Investigators' focus turned to the phone calls Black received on the days leading up to his trip to Florida. We obtained the phone records of Frank Black, which identified phone calls from a residence in Jupiter and the residence in Jupiter was rented, it was a, a, a townhome rented by a girl identified as Lisa Costello. She wasn't blonde, but she was five foot one. Mia Giordano had described herself as being exactly that height. The calls from Lisa Costello matched the times when Mia Giordano allegedly phoned Black to set up the meeting in Florida. Mia Giordano was a fictitious figure. She never existed. And she was supposed to set up the deal with Frank Black. Mia Giordano was actually Lisa Costello. Investigators took Costello's photo to the hotel where Black's credit card had been used on February 25th. The resort was on the strip at Riviera Beach. The state agent asked to speak to the clerk who had been on duty the morning in question. While he waited, he checked the phone that had been used with Black's credit card. Like the gas pump, the phone required no signature from a customer, just a credit card. Anyone could have made the calls. Karen Voorhees had worked the front desk on the morning in question. she did not recognize a photo of Frank Black. She did recall waiting on another customer that morning. At around 2 a.m., a dark-haired woman asked for a room. The hotel was booked, so she used a payphone several times to query other hotels. It was the same time Frank Black's credit card was used at the phone. Voorhees described the woman as being in her 30s with brown hair and standing a little over five feet tall. Driscoll showed Voorhees a photographic lineup of six women. Without hesitation, the clerk picked out Lisa Costello. 
Lisa Costello was now really the primary suspect. I mean, we did have some evidence on her that then uh, we checked the uh, car rental agencies by the West Palm Beach Airport and found out that Lisa Costello rented a car just shortly before the time that Frank Black's flight arrived. Investigators found the car at the airport rental lot. A subpoena allowed them to impound it for an evidence search by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. But examiners would find no trace of Frank Black in the car. There was no physical evidence linking Lisa Costello to the missing businessman. Florida investigators began covert surveillance on Lisa Costello. They followed the suspect for days to establish a routine and determine her contacts. They soon learned that Costello was dating a man named Alan Mackerley. Investigators began to tail Mackerley. Like Frank Black, he also owned a bus company in New Jersey, but was now living in Florida. The two men had known each other most of their lives. Over the years, Alan Mackerley and Frank Black built up a rivalry. The two bus companies are about 10 miles apart. So even though they each had their own contracts and their own business, they were always vying for the same contracts in the same business. Phone records indicated recent calls to Black from Mackerley's Florida home. This seemed strange since the two men were fierce rivals. Detectives went to speak with the manager of Black's bus company. Sally Roberts said Black and Mackerley used to be friends, but their business rivalry had made them enemies. She detailed the last time she had seen the men together. It was at an industry banquet in January of 1996. She and Frank were talking with friends when she saw Mackerley approaching. Angry that Black had stolen one of his major bus contracts, Mackerley threatened his rival. He said he was going to get him and put him under. That could mean put him out of business, and it could also possibly mean he was going to kill him someday. Black took the threat seriously. Afterwards, he wouldn't go to any meeting that Mackerley might attend, unless he had someone with him. Investigators contacted Mackerley to ask him if he had seen or spoken to Frank Black recently. Mackerley flatly denied calling him in the days preceding Black's trip to Florida. Him denying that and us knowing phone, rec phone calls have been made from his house to Frank Black's business obviously uh, indicated something uh, was wrong. Investigators believed that Mackerley and Costello had probably killed Frank Black. But they needed stronger proof. They turned to assistant state attorney Robert Belanger. One of the first investigative tools that the FDLE wanted to use was wiretaps. So you have to show uh, a really compelling reason for listening to someone's telephone conversations. So we drafted those applications and orders and obtained uh, an order allowing us to listen to Alan Mackerley's telephone conversations. Unfortunately, investigators heard very few phone conversations between Mackerley and Costello. This was because Costello was now living with Mackerley. If they were talking about Black's disappearance, it wasn't over the phone. In order to record any incriminating conversations, investigators would have to bug Mackerley's house. 
Assistant State Attorney Lawrence Merman hoped they had enough probable cause to get inside. Being able to actually enter someone's home and plant a listening device is extremely restrictive and the, and the probable cause that's required is very high. Uh, the situations that would warrant that are very limited. This case actually presented that situation. A judge signed the warrant, and investigators planted listening devices in Mackerley's home. They set up outside, watching and listening. Got it. Hopefully, the couple would discuss what happened to Frank Black. Alan Mackerley and Lisa Costello were extremely cautious. Investigators believe the couple knew they were listening. And every time that we would uh, hear them starting to talk, the, they would turn the radio up in the kitchen loud. So we probably have several hundred hours of uh, tapes with nothing but, but music on it. Once again, investigators came up empty-handed. Our chief assistant state attorney, Dave Morgan, had even commented to me after we failed to get anything on the wiretaps, it looks like Alan McAlee's gotten away with murder. Alan, what are you doing? With Black's body still missing, McAlee and Costello could elude authorities as long as they maintained their silence. In June of 1996, Florida state agents believed that Alan McAlee and his girlfriend Lisa Costello had murdered 58-year-old millionaire Frank Black. But investigators had little evidence against the couple, and Black's body was still missing. They checked morgues in Palm Beach, Broward, and Dade counties where Black was last known to have traveled. There were no unidentified bodies matching Frank Black's description. If Mackerley and Costello had killed Black, they had covered their tracks well. Florida Department of Law Enforcement Special Agent Michael Driscoll expressed his frustration to his friend, FBI Special Agent Jay Miller. We used to play racquetball together, and he'd ask me about how this case was going, and I'd tell him, you know, a little bit about it, not, not a whole lot, it, and uh, he'd say, well, if you ever need a hand, and uh, I'd be happy to help out. In June of 1996, Special Agent Jay Miller asked to be assigned the case out of the FBI's Fort Pierce Resident Agency. And even though we were close friends, initially I did not know a lot of the details about uh, Frank Black's disappearance. But uh, as I could sense his frustration, I was able to elicit more information about the case. And uh, we were able then to come to an understanding that we needed to look at this thing again from the start. Though investigators believe McAuley killed Black over a disputed busing contract, Wiretaps and listening devices had failed to tie him to any crime. Investigators' best lead was still Black's alleged meeting with Costello. Perhaps if subpoenaed and confronted with the evidence, she would turn on McAuley. It was a gamble that could jeopardize their entire case. By giving anyone, in this case Lisa Costello, a subpoena, it compels her to come in and give information, and it gives her immunity. Hypothetically, if she came in and admitted she killed Frank Black, she would be immune from that statement. You could not use that statement against her. On June 13, 1996, Lisa Costello appeared before a Florida grand jury. I'm not answering now. When questioned by state attorneys, she was uncooperative and hostile. The judge cautioned her that if she did not answer, she would be jailed for contempt.
Costello ignored his warnings. Investigators believed her refusal to cooperate confirmed she was involved in Black's disappearance. But it would take more than a hunch to solve the case. The gamble to subpoena Costello backfired. Now that Mackerley's closest ally was sitting behind bars, investigators had no potential witnesses to turn on the suspected murderer. Lacking further leads or physical evidence, the case against Mackerley might never make it to trial. Special Agent Michael Driscoll and his team were determined to keep this from happening. We heard information that, let's just say from a confidential source, that there was a witness who wanted to talk but was concerned about, one, that witness's own involvement, and two, Alan McAlee's violence. Felt that Alan McAlee was a violent person and that maybe there'd be retaliation if this unknown and unidentified witness would, would talk. That witness was Bill Anderson. A former Marine pilot, Anderson was one of Alan McAlee's closest friends. Agents interviewed him at his home in Florida, just down the street from Mackerley. Anderson had also owned a bus company in New Jersey and had been a commercial pilot after a decade of military service. So now we had two investigators, Driscoll and myself, and a prosecutor, Alanjay, all being Marines, and then the person who we believe could be the key to solving the case, Bill Anderson being a Marine. And so I think there was some camaraderie right there from the start. Investigators felt that bond would help them develop Anderson as a witness. He told the agents his friendship with McAlee had been strained recently, but he was reluctant to detail McAlee's relationship with Frank Black. The agents felt Anderson knew something that could break the case wide open. There was a little hesitancy on his part. We took it easy on him and uh, gave him a little space, gave him the opportunity to do whatever he needed to do, to confer with counsel or whatever. In our minds, we knew that we were talking to the man that had the answers, and he wasn't telling us. The agents met with Anderson on many occasions and slowly won his confidence. Thank you very much for your time. They knew he was loyal to his friend Alan McAlee, but they felt his sense of honor would eventually cause him to turn. Despite Anderson's lingering doubts, agents believed he was ready to talk by early August. They suspected a subpoena would help him justify turning against his friend. In my experience, good, honest, hardworking people that, that flew fighter jets in the Marine Corps would have a difficult time going under oath before the whole world and God and lying about it. Investigators had to take the chance. Like Costello, if Anderson had any part in the crime, his statements could not be used to prosecute him for murder. Five months after the disappearance of millionaire Frank Black, investigators had little evidence to support their theory that Black was murdered by his business rival, Alan McAlee. Looking for a fresh lead, investigators subpoenaed McAlee's close friend, Bill Anderson. Anderson had been reluctant to talk, but after a month, the former Marine's sense of honor prevailed. He began by telling investigators that Alan McAlee had purchased a plane earlier that year. McAlee asked Anderson to become his private pilot, since Anderson had experience flying fighter jets and commercial airliners. In exchange, Anderson could use McAlee's plane as he wished. In March of 1996, while staying at a hotel in Leesburg, Florida, to supervise repairs on the plane, Anderson was contacted by McAlee. His friend said he needed him to take the plane out over the ocean. Anderson explained that the aircraft would be grounded for several more days. 
he suggested they rent another plane. McAuley insisted on using his own plane. He didn't want anybody else to know about the flight. Anderson asked why. McAuley told Bill that he had shot Frank Black and that they had wrapped his body up in plastic, that they had taken the body out in the ocean and thrown it out in the ocean, and that the, the bag did not sink. And uh, he went on to tell Bill that it, it didn't sink, so he took a knife and stuck some holes in it, and uh, the body did sink. McAuley told Anderson he was worried that the body had surfaced. He wanted to fly over the area to make sure it hadn't. Anderson refused. Anderson was shocked. I mean, I, I think he was truly shocked. Anderson, again, was in the bus business, as was McAuley and Black. And uh, Anderson and Black were not friends. Uh, Anderson did not like Black in the least either. But still, over a business rivalry, you don't kill somebody. According to Anderson, McAuley murdered Black in the foyer of his house. The former Marine pilot confirmed what investigators had suspected all along. It was the big break in the case. I mean, this was the moment we were all waiting for. And <clears throat> I remember explaining to him right away that, Bill, we're going to have to do a covert recording of you rehashing this conversation with Alan McAuley. Without a body or murder weapon, they would need McAuley's confession on tape. Anderson's testimony was good, but in court it would be his word against McAuley's. Anderson told prosecutor Robert Belange that he was reluctant to wear a wire. He was afraid of McAuley because he admitted that he had just killed someone, and McAuley had also told him about a, a, an acquaintance up in New Jersey that got convicted of a crime because someone wore a wire, and he told Bill Anderson, if anyone ever wore a wire on me, I'd kill them. The investigators promised Anderson police protection. He agreed to wear the wire. The plan was to lure McAuley to Anderson's house. You'll be okay, so don't worry about it. Yeah, this is confident. This is well concealed. FBI techs wired Anderson for sound and hid a video camera in the kitchen. When the equipment was in place, Anderson called McAuley. He told him he'd been served a subpoena and wanted to talk about what he should do. McAuley said he would be right over. In case something went wrong, Agent Driscoll would remain hidden in the house to protect Anderson. When the team outside saw McAuley approaching, they would radio Driscoll to hide. Yeah. Well, in a minute. While waiting, investigators spotted telephone repairmen. McAuley was paranoid about being bugged. If he saw the workers, he might think they were undercover agents. We knew that if he came to that house and saw these telephone company trucks, that it would have been all over as far as the investigation. McAuley would be there any minute. The investigators quickly ordered the repairman to leave. They then concealed the dig site. The investigators made it back to the car just before McAuley pulled up. The investigators tried to alert the men in the house, but they received no response. They radioed again. Still nothing.
they had no way to know if Driscoll had received their call. He hadn't. The agent had seconds to hide. Anderson led Mackerly to the kitchen and sat down at the table as planned. He showed Mackerly the subpoena. Mackerly was hesitant to talk. He wouldn't talk loudly. He was pointing to the walls and saying, no, whispering like this, no, no, nobody knows. Whispering so that he couldn't be heard in Anderson's house. Not that he suspected Bill Anderson, but because he expected that the police were everywhere. They were. Detective Liddy and the others listened to McAuley and Anderson from the car. They had a discussion about what Bill Anderson was to testify to and whether or not Bill Anderson should lie for Alan McAuley. Bill Anderson even asked Alan McAuley that if he did uh, refuse to testify and was put in jail if Alan Mackerley would come forward and then tell the truth, and Alan Mackerley assured him that he would. Mackerley didn't want to continue talking in the house. He led Anderson you outside. Told anyone else what you told me. No, no. This way. whole thing was supposed to take place at Bill Anderson's kitchen table and no place else. And so when he heard Alan Mackerley say, let's take a walk, uh, we were concerned that he was walking Bill Anderson out somewhere to eliminate him. He told anyone else what he told me. No, nobody. The property was large lied, and covered with dense good. foliage. Will you come they could have walked anywhere. But McAuley unknowingly walked Anderson close to the surveillance team. My car is parked only a matter of probably uh, 80 or 100 feet from McAuley and Anderson. And we could hear distinctly on the transmitter their footsteps as they walked through the gravel and they walked closer to my vehicle with very little coverage concealing my, uh, my vehicle. The four of us sat there frozen in our car wondering, is this whole thing going to be blown because he's going to see us? Their case and their cooperating witness were in jeopardy. I'm sorry. If the investigators were discovered, they might not be able to protect Anderson from Mackerley's rage. Investigators in Florida watched as cooperating witness Bill Anderson met with murder suspect Alan Mackerley. Anderson was wearing a wire trying to get Mackerley to discuss the murder of Frank Black. New Jersey detective Lee Liddy feared what McAuley might do if he caught a glimpse of the nearby investigators. The two of them walked outside, which was very tense for all the investigators involved because at this point we have no control over what happens, where they go, or what they say. And because they were walking and because of the pant leg of Bill Anderson rubbing and the movement of the clothes, it was very difficult to pick up conversation. So at that point we really weren't sure what was happening. Before McAuley could spot the surveillance team, Anderson steered him away. Investigators now had incriminating statements on tape, but not a direct confession. They needed more. McAuley's alleged accomplice, Lisa Costello, remained in jail. She had been charged with contempt of court three months earlier for refusing to honor her subpoena. Agents would seek information from her friends to increase the pressure on the hostile witness. They interviewed Costello's former roommate. She said Costello used to deal cocaine and the sedative rufinol, which is odorless and tasteless. Depending on the dose, rufinol can relax a person or render them unconscious. FDLE Special Agent Michael Driscoll believed Costello sedated Frank Black with the drug. We suspected, matter of fact, from day one, that at some point Lisa and Frank Black 
may have gone to dinner or for drinks, and she was able to do that because he would not, he, Frank Black would not willingly or knowingly go into Alan McAuley's house. Hoping this information might pressure her into talking, a prosecutor met with Lisa Costello in jail. He told her that if she didn't cooperate, she would not have immunity. She could be charged with murder. Costello remained silent, despite the warnings of prosecutor Robert Belanger. And Lisa Costello could have walked out of that jail cell any day simply by coming out and honoring that subpoena and telling us what she knew about the case. But she was a tough enough uh, witness that she sat in jail on a civil contempt. Despite Costello's silence, investigators pressed on. Assistant State Attorney Lawrence Merman felt they were ready to arrest. We had a, uh, an ear witness to a confession who was a very close friend of the defendant. We had a motive, we had circumstantial evidence. It was a very strong case. On August 29th, agents began aerial surveillance on Alan McAuley. A ground team assembled around the perimeter of the suspect's house. They made sure he was alone inside. That evening, the arrest team positioned themselves by his door. They would wait until he emerged to take him down in the open. When he stepped out with his dog, the team struck. The stunned suspect offered no resistance. Seven months after Frank Black vanished, Alan McAuley was arrested for kidnapping and murder. With no physical evidence, prosecutors prepared for a difficult trial. When McAuley's arrest hit the news, they received a call from a man with information on the case. The man agreed to give a statement. Robert Senadazian was Alan McAuley's son-in-law. He said that he'd received a call from McAuley on February 25th, the day after Black arrived in Florida. McAuley asked him to come over to help him clean his house. When Sanadazian arrived on Monday, February 26th, he saw that McAuley and Costello had already begun major renovations in the foyer. The carpet had been ripped up and parts of the wall had been removed. Sanadazian told prosecutor Robert Belanger that McAuley explained why. Alan McAuley told Rob Sanandajian, Frank Black was at my home last Saturday. And even Sanandajian knew the relationship between Alan McAuley and Frank Black and expressed some surprise. Why would, why would Frank Black be at your home? And Alan clearly didn't want to talk about it. He just said, given the O.J. Simpson trial, DNA evidence, we got to make sure there's not even a hair of Frank Black's found in this home. Sanadazian swore that he never saw any blood. Special Agent Miller asked if Sanadazian had questioned McAuley about what had happened. His response was something to the effect that he didn't have to ask his father-in-law, that he knew something really bad had occurred there in the house, and that they were, in fact, cleaning up a mess. They used an industrial vacuum cleaner to clean the entire area. Then McAuley asked Sanadazian to help him haul the debris to the local dump. Sanadazian told investigators that he and McAuley discarded sheetrock carpeting and even the vacuum cleaner in the Martin County landfill. His statement corroborated Bill Anderson's story. Anderson told us that McAuley had told him that he had killed Frank Black in the entry to his house. And now we had Sandasian telling us that immediately 
after Frank Black's disappearance, he was summoned to that house to do a remodeling job or a, a makeover of the foyer area right where Anderson states Mackerly said he shot Frank Black. In the middle of August, an evidence recovery team arrived at the landfill. Based on records, investigators were able to determine where the items were likely dumped six months earlier on February 26th. The recovery team searched for anything that could be traced back to Mackerley's home. For three hot days, investigators scoured a specific area of the landfill. The landfill uh, management was able to determine by the date exactly where it was. And it was in a spot that was actually feasible and possible that we'd find it. So uh, we did that. We got the equipment uh, with the sheriff's office, crime scene, and so forth. And we dug it up. And we found carpeting that we believed was from Mackley's residence. Investigators found portions of sheetrock and a vacuum cleaner that matched the description Sanitation had given. They brought the items to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement Forensics Laboratory for analysis. Despite their strong suspicions, lab analysts were unable to conclusively match any of the items to Mackerley's house. Technicians also processed Mackerley's foyer and retrieved traces of what appeared to be blood. Unfortunately, DNA markers found in the samples could not be exclusively matched to Frank Black's DNA. It was another dead end. Investigators still had no physical evidence. Agents pressed on, continuing to build a strong circumstantial case for state prosecutor Belanger by further corroborating Sanadazian's story about the cleanup. The FBI went to Walmarts and Kmarts and got receipts where Alan Mackerley was buying bleach and Comet and cleaning supplies and trash bags and duct tape and all the tools and implements he needed to clean up a crime scene. Just before trial, investigators received disturbing news. Martin County jail inmates claimed that Mackerley had hired someone to kill Bill Anderson. Mackerley knew that if he could prevent Anderson from testifying, prosecutors would have to drop their case. Early in 1997, murder suspect Alan McAlee was held without bond for the murder of Frank Black. While he was behind bars, investigators learned he had ordered the murder of witness Bill Anderson. As of that point, uh, the security for Bill Anderson tremendously increased and we began making arrangements uh, to have Bill uh, and his wife go into the uh, Federal Witness Protection Program. Mackerley's would-be hitman would not be a reliable witness in court, so attempted murder-for-hire charges against Mackerley were dropped. Alan Mackerley's trial began on January 20th, 1998. Even without the victim's body, Florida State Prosecutor Robert Belanger was confident in the case. There's case law going back to old England where murderers have been prosecuted uh, without a body successfully, uh, and the courts have said that we don't reward people because they successfully disposed of the body. You can still prove death through circumstantial evidence like any other fact in the case by pr person's habits and routines, uh, by the fact that they didn't pack for a long trip, um, by declarations of intent, I'm going to go to Florida. Uh, all these things uh, combined demonstrated pretty conclusively that Frank Black was dead. Nevertheless, that is a, a source of frustration. Mr. Mackerley told me the that prosecution's main witness, Bill Anderson, Black recalled what he knew about Frank, Frank Black's murder. Prosecutors filled in the gaps and detailed the events of February 24, 1996, the last day Black was seen alive. Mackerley's lover, Lisa Costello, picked up Frank Black at the West Palm Beach Airport that evening.
she took him to Mackerley's house on the pretense of meeting other business partners. Black was unaware that he had just stepped into the home of his bitter rival. While Costello and Black discussed the lucrative business deal, prosecutors believe Costello dropped a capsule of Rufinol into his drink. Black would not have noticed. The powerful sedative is odorless, colorless, and tasteless. The two talked while Costello waited for the drug to take effect. As planned, McAuley took over at that point. He had Costello remove Black's wallet. Hey, why don't you go get changed? Later, they would use his credit cards to create a false trail for police. Black was powerless due to the heavy sedative. Get up. Finally in control of his rival, McAuley's hatred boiled over. In the foyer, he put a gun to Black's head. Alan? Alan! McAuley had to get rid of the evidence. He wrapped the body and murder weapon in plastic. Using one of his power boats, he would later dump the body about 16 miles offshore. Body out about 20 miles. Anderson testified that McAuley said he had to stab through the plastic in Black's body several times to get it to sink. He, in, he then returned home to finish cleaning up. He tore out anything that had been stained by blood or human tissue. Using bleach, they scrubbed the entire area clean. Anderson's testimony was bolstered by powerful circumstantial evidence. Phone calls linking McAuley and Black, Robert Sanadagian's story of the cleanup, and covert recordings from Anderson's house. Thunder will rise. How do you find the defendant? It was enough to convince the jury. On February 4, 1998, they found Alan McAuley guilty of kidnapping and murder. After McAuley's trial, prosecutors turned to Lisa Costello. When I looked, I saw the dead body of Faced with murder charges, she finally gave a full statement as to the events that led to Frank Black's death. Ultimately, she entered a plea to third-degree murder and false imprisonment, which are lesser-included offenses. She was sentenced to 10 years in the Florida State Prison. An appeals court overturned McAuley's kidnapping conviction, finding that Frank Black traveled to Florida on his own volition. But the murder conviction stood. Alan McAuley was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Although Frank Black's body has not yet been recovered, his killer, Alan McAuley, will never go free. Thirteen-year-old Amy McNeil had her whole life ahead of her. But when she was kidnapped on her way to school, her future was in peril. The first call her terrified parents made was to the FBI. They hoped that the combined experience of agents and local law enforcement would flesh out the kidnappers before they took her life.
Wealth has its rewards, but it also brings its dangers. Kidnapping is one of them. No ordeal is more horrifying for a family than to have a child taken. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Kidnapping cases are among the most challenging for law enforcement, who often must remain out of sight, yet close at hand, ready to move in at a moment's notice. About 20 miles south of Fort Worth, Texas, lies Alvarado, a small town in rural Johnson County. A few wealthy residents found Alvarado a safe haven away from the state's urban centers. The McNeils were among them. They lived as one of the area's most prominent families, partly from the return that Mr. McNeil made by selling an early design of the handheld calculator. At 7.15 a.m. on Friday, January 11, 1985, they began their day having breakfast together as was their usual routine. Amy! Afterwards, their teenage son would drive himself and his 13-year-old sister, Amy, to school. Please be careful out there today. Come on, come on, come on. Bye, Amy. Bye. 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 On the way, Amy and her brother stopped to pick up their cousin as well. He and his family lived in a separate house on the McNeil estate. At about 7.45, they were finally on their way to class. Then, from behind an abandoned truck, a sedan pulled out across the road, forcing the teenager's Jeep off to the side. A gunman jumped out of the car and approached the Jeep. He demanded that Amy get into the sedan. The blonde-haired man warned her brother not to contact the authorities. He would call the family in a short while with his demands. Instinctively, the teenager started to get out to help his sister. Leave and go home, boy! But the kidnappers threatened to kill him and his sister if he tried to follow them as they raced off with the 13-year-old. The teenagers couldn't make out the license plate. In a matter of seconds, the girl was gone. They turned around and sped home. The boys told the McNeils what had happened and repeated the kidnappers' warning not to contact the authorities. They pulled us over and they had guns. And then if you told the police that they kill her, Mr. McNeil ignored the demand and called the FBI field office in nearby Fort Worth. Give me the FBI. Former FBI Special Agent Clint Brown, a 30-year veteran, understood that when a kidnapping occurs, every second counts. Hello, uh, this is Clint Brown. I worked many kidnapping cases, okay. and uh, in right. not a right. single case right okay. uh, did the subject get away with it. The number one goal in all cases like this is the safe return of the victim. All uh, activities, all actions are all geared toward not doing anything to endanger the safety of the person who's been kidnapped. The FBI's first task was to set up a recorder on the family's phone. By capturing the kidnapper's voice, they hoped to identify him or the place he was calling from. The FBI also informed the local phone company to be prepared to trace any incoming calls. Agents instructed the father on how to handle the call. He needed to insist on proof from the kidnappers that his daughter was still alive. The fact that they had worn no disguises disturbed former Johnson County Sheriff Eddie Boggs, who called in the Texas Rangers moments after he arrived. The kidnappers hadn't tried to conceal who they were at all. They just, as we call it, they just barefaced them, just no masks, no uh, disguises, anything. That means there's not going to be a victim around to tell who they are or what they look like. Uh, they're going to kill them. Uncovering the kidnappers' identities might prevent that. Using an identikit that included hundreds of facial features, investigators worked with Amy's brother and cousin, building a composite of the man who held the shotgun. 
The teenagers had never seen the man with the stringy blonde hair before. They also provided a description of the kidnapper's car. It seems like the people who engage in this are people of uh, questionable and limited mental capacity. And uh, very often they have, uh, I guess what you might say, delusions based on uh, drug use. Uh, very often, you know, the need to get money to promote their drug habits are, are what drives them. And so uh, we have that being a, a motive for the kidnappings very much. And, and that uh, certainly impairs their ability to think or plan or pull this off successfully. At 10 a.m., over two hours after Amy had been abducted, the phone finally rang. Hello? It was one of her kidnappers. Yeah? Did you just thought I'd tell you I had your daughter? The man demanded a $100,000 yeah. ransom. Yeah? Half was to be in $100 bills, the other half in smaller denominations. None of it could be sequenced. As instructed, Amy's father pleaded to speak to his daughter. But the kidnapper refused. Her captor insisted Amy was still alive and that her father could speak to her. When the man called back to say where to drop the ransom, he added that if the family called the FBI, they would never see Amy again. The call lasted less than a minute, not long enough to establish a trace for the technology of 1985. Agents played back the recording, listening for any background noise that might reveal the location. They figured the call was likely made from a payphone since they could hear wind and traffic noise. But they heard nothing more specific. And no one in the family recognized the kidnapper's voice. Though Amy's family was wealthy, her father did not have $100,000 in cash available since most of his assets were tied up in investments. He called his associates to fly in on chartered planes with whatever cash they were able to withdraw. The next call they received was not the one retired Sheriff Eddie Boggs had hoped for. The press had learned of the kidnapping from one of McNeil's neighbors. I got a call from my chief deputy, and he said that uh, he has all sorts of media representatives uh, out there wanting a story. They knew that there had been a kidnapping, there had been a ransom demand. They demanded to talk to somebody about the story and that they were going to go on the air with it. If the kidnappers discovered that law enforcement was involved, they would likely dispose of Amy before the ransom was delivered. Investigators discussed what they should do next as precious minutes ticked by. The FBI instructed the family and the Johnson County Sheriff on how to proceed. And the FBI said, well, here's what you do. You have your chief deputy call each one of the reporters in, ask him for his ID, ask him who is the very top man at his station that he can talk to, and then tell that top man, we're not going to confirm whether or not you have a story, but if you do have a story and you run it, run it, you could possibly cost the life of a little girl. Every local press agency agreed not to run the story until notified by the sheriff. Just before one o'clock in the afternoon, the phone rang again. Hello? Yeah, I'm the guy who's got your daughter. It was the same man who had called earlier. On a separate line, an agent contacted the chief of security at the local phone company, who was standing by, hoping to trace the call. Yeah. He trapped the number yeah, and began to track right its origin. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. McNeil begged the kidnapper to let him hear his daughter's voice. This time, the man allowed the frightened girl to speak to her father. Daddy? Her eyes concealed to prevent her from knowing where she was. Hey, you haven't hurt me. Be my girl. He could hear her crying. Despite his own fear, he reassured Amy that everything would be okay and that she would soon be home. That's when the man grabbed the phone. The kidnapper said that he had not yet secured a location for the ransom to be dropped. 
What do you mean you're having trouble getting a drop zone? Again, he promised to call back later. Hello? The room fell silent, as former Texas Ranger Bill Gunn recalls. It was very heart-rending to listen to it. She was frightened. Uh, and of course, Mr. McNeil was frightened. The conversation was very short. Mr. McNeil encouraged her to uh, keep her upper lip up and re remember who she was. And that was the end of the conversation. They hoped the trace would be successful. That's the hardest part, correct? The security chief reported that the call had originated from outside the phone company's calling area. And since the call had been terminated, it would be impossible to trace it through the neighboring system. The phone company was able to determine that the call was made from somewhere in the town of Kennedale, 25 miles north of the McNeil's estate. Good. Amy was still okay. in Texas, close to Fort Worth. Okay. Kennedale? Okay, but without a specific location, investigators had little to go on. We had no idea, no evidence, no, no leads, nowhere to go. The only thing we had was the description of a car. Uh, I did have my troops, what few I had, to go out and start in a perimeter, uh, expanding the perimeter, checking every farm, every house, every housing addition, everywhere they could for a car that matched the description that we had. Johnson County deputies fanned out over a 30-mile radius from Alvarado up to Kennedale, searching for the kidnapper's car. They also alerted other local officers to be on the lookout for the four-door sedan. Yet without a license plate, it was not likely they'd locate the vehicle among the rural expanse. Almost six hours after 13-year-old Amy McNeil had been abducted, her father's friends from Texas and Arkansas had begun to arrive in Alvarado carrying tens of thousands in cash. Texas Rangers escorted them from a small airport to a local bank where the currency would be processed before it was paid to the kidnappers. Wearing latex gloves, Rangers recorded and bundled the $100,000 ransom. They assembled half of it in $100 bills, as the kidnapper had instructed. Another $50,000 was compiled from smaller denominations. Retired Texas Ranger Sergeant John Dendy helped direct the processing. They had quite a time raising that amount of money on such short notice. But after, after they got the money, then uh, the rangers that were at the bank started to uh, get in clean bags to put it in. In other words, no, no fingerprints, plastic bags, and uh, made copies of the bills. So we'd have the serial numbers on each bill. Everything was loaded up, and then all we had to do then was sit and wait until more demands came in. In the late afternoon, deputies had located a car that fit the description of the kidnapper's vehicle, parked 20 miles from the McNeil's estate. A license plate check revealed that the sedan had been stolen the day before from Mesquite, Texas, 50 miles east of Alvarado. Inside, deputies found no obvious signs of Amy or her abductors. They impounded the car and continued to canvass the area for witnesses who may have seen the driver. At the Johnson County Sheriff's Department, the FBI processed the sedan for forensic evidence. From the interior, they removed several sets of fingerprints. But without a suspect's prints to compare them to, the recovered prints could not help identify Amy's captors or their current whereabouts. By 11.30 p.m., 16 hours after Amy had been taken, her family had received three more phone calls, but still had not been told where the ransom was to be dropped. They hoped this would be the call that could secure Amy's release. It was the same man who had called earlier. Yeah. 
Once again, the phone company initiated yeah. a trace. Yeah, I'm working on it right now. Amy's father told the kidnapper that he had the $100,000 prepared as the man had requested. No, I don't want to do this tomorrow. But the caller said that it was too late. The ransom drop he had in mind was at least 200 miles away from Alvarado. By the time Mr. McNeil reached the location, it would be light, too risky for the kidnapper to take a chance on being seen. The father pleaded to make the exchange tonight. The man refused. He said he'd call back tomorrow to make the arrangements. We didn't think they would uh, let us have her back alive you know, in, in good shape. We, we had no idea what they'd done to her in this period of time that they'd had her. Agents waited for word to see if the trace had been successful. Yeah. No, what long enough? It had not. No. Okay, Once again, the phone okay. company had failed to secure the kidnapper's location. Investigators could only hope that 13-year-old Amy McNeil would survive the night and eventually be reunited with her parents. By 5 p.m. on Saturday, January 12, 1985, a day and a half had passed since 13-year-old Amy McNeil had been kidnapped on her way to school in Alvarado, Texas. One of several unidentified kidnappers had called Amy's wealthy family seven times he demanded $100,000 in unsequenced currency, but had not told the McNeils where to drop the ransom. Though the kidnapper had also warned Amy's family not to call the FBI, Mr. McNeil had done so and was joined by several hey agents, a dozen Texas Rangers, and the Johnson County Sheriff's Department. Her abductors had promised to call again at 5 p.m. with the location of the ransom exchange and to confirm that Amy remained unharmed. Despite the agonizing wait, former Special Agent Clint Brown and his team wasted no time in preparing. When the instructions uh, were anticipated, a plan was devised to deliver the ransom money with uh, Mr. McNeil driving the car and carrying the money uh, himself for delivery so that anybody would see the car. It was the limousine that, that he had they would assume he was in the car by himself. Actually concealed in the car would be two FBI agents. The agents also outfitted Mr. McNeil with a mini cassette device to record any conversations he may have with the kidnappers if they should approach his limousine. The interior of the car would be wired as well, and the two concealed agents would be heavily armed. At 5.10 p.m., the kidnapper called again. He told Mr. McNeil to drive 40 miles alone in his limousine from Alvarado on Interstate 30 to East Dallas and take exit 51. There he would find a gas station. The father was to be there by 7 p.m. in order to receive further instructions on the payphone by the vending machine. Mr. McNeil spoke to Amy briefly before her abductor disconnected. She was scared, but unharmed. The call was too brief to be traced. All right, call As again. planned, a contingent of FBI, Texas Rangers, and Johnson County personnel would follow McNeil's car at a distance. The team would be fully equipped, as retired Texas Ranger Bill Gunn remembers. We got all of the assets available uh, tracking devices, uh, aircraft. Uh, we had a tracking device on Mr. McNeil's car so that if we lost contact with it on the ground, both aircraft could receive it. Amy's father promised his wife that he wouldn't come home without their daughter. He was fitted with body armor and provided with a sidearm in the event the kidnappers attacked him. The two agents with him would be armed with shotguns and semi-automatic pistols. They checked their radios to make sure they could be heard by the follow team. You guys okay back there? 
Check one, check two. Retired FBI Special Agent Rod Kicklighter was assigned to ride in the limousine and advise the concerned father. I recall one of our uh, main instructions to him was uh, not to let himself uh, be taken hostage. And uh, we talked through that quite a bit. Uh, he was to deliver the money, and we would then take over, try to effect the arrest, but he was uh, in no way to uh, get involved himself. McNeil got the go-ahead to leave for the gas station in East Dallas, 40 miles away. When the limo had reached about a mile, the agent instructed the others to follow. Since the kidnapper had provided a specific route to the Dallas gas station, former Ranger Sergeant John Dendy and the others feared that the kidnappers could be surveilling the limousine as it traveled. We had no idea where they would be, who they were, or what they were in, or anything about them. And uh, in order for them not to become uh, suspicious of any of us, we kept a, a good distance behind, behind the car. As the stretch crossed county lines, the Rangers radioed ahead to local authorities. They informed traffic patrols not to stop the speeding unmarked cars and provided license plates for their vehicles. Several units raced ahead to set up surveillance at the service station in East Dallas. While most maintained an outside perimeter, one team held a distant view of the payphone. They stood by, ready to act, in the event that the kidnappers revealed themselves or their 13-year-old hostage. Agents reported that the limousine had just reached exit 51. The phone had begun ringing at exactly 7 p.m when Amy's father rolled into the service station. What? Okay, hold on, hold on. It was the eighth call he had okay. received from his daughter's kidnappers over the past 34 hours. The man did not give the father the news he had hoped for. He told Mr. McNeil to take Interstate 20 east to Tyler, Texas, almost 100 miles from Dallas. At the US 69 exit, he would find another gas station where he'd receive another call at 9.20 on the payphone outside. For retired Special Agent Clint Brown, it was difficult to predict what Amy's abductors might be planning. We could tell the kidnappers uh, were not very well organized. They uh, seemed somewhat uh, ill at ease, confused. Uh, uh, some of their plans seemed to change. They didn't seem to have a clear idea of uh, uh, where the money was to be delivered, and so it even appeared to be stalling at times, uh, trying to uh, formulate a workable plan that they thought they could use. So it did not appear that they had uh, thought this out very well at all. At the second gas station in Tyler, Amy's father was directed to drive to a third one in Longview, 40 miles further east, by 11 p.m. And there, he was ordered to drive 60 more miles north to a fourth gas station in Mount Pleasant, Texas. Precisely at midnight, he'd receive another call at the payphone outside. By now, investigators had covered over 180 miles, traveling for well over five and a half hours. They hadn't anticipated the long trip, and two surveillance aircraft were forced to turn back to refuel in Dallas. Despite their frustrations, the team was determined to outlast the kidnappers. We had no idea what they were going to do next. They just kept running us over East Texas. We, we saw a large portion of East Texas, and we didn't know when it was going to stop. But we knew that we were there for the duration. But the situation was only getting worse. About halfway to the Mount Pleasant gas station, the limousine began losing power. 
After racing at speeds in excess of 100 miles an hour for extended periods, the engine simply quit. Agent Kicklighter feared that the mechanical problem would jeopardize any chance they may have still had to rescue the 13-year-old. We're all getting uh, a little tense and excited and uh, worried that we're not going to get to the drop site and that we're not going to be able to get Amy back. Dozens of miles away at the gas station in Mount Pleasant, two camouflage Texas Ranger snipers had been deployed to surveil the payphone. At midnight, it began to ring. Mr. McNeil was the only one who could answer. But he missed the call. At midnight on January 13, 1985, just outside Mount Pleasant, Texas, two FBI agents and the wealthy father of a kidnapped 13-year-old girl worked frantically to repair a limousine's engine. Mr. McNeil's limousine was the car his daughter's kidnappers expected him to be driving alone to a Mount Pleasant gas station payphone by midnight. As Mr. McNeil tried to restart his car, two camouflaged Texas Ranger snipers deployed to surveil the gas station watched helplessly as the phone began ringing. Mr. McNeil was the only one who could answer, but he missed the call for the final location of the $100,000 ransom exchange. Patrolling the desolate roads around the gas station in Mount Pleasant, the support team was informed that Mr. McNeil had finally found his car's difficulty, according to former FBI Special Agent Clint Brown. The car that Mr. McNeil was riding in began to develop uh, electrical problems. Uh, apparently, the uh, alternator wasn't keeping the battery charged up, and so as time went on, the lights began to dim, and he began to have um, trouble with the electrical system of the car. The communications and tracking devices wired to the limo system had drained its power over the past seven hours. Disconnecting several instruments provided enough juice to get the engine started again. Though the headlights were inoperable, the car would move forward. Mr. McNeil and the two agents pressed on without full power and limited visibility. Their path was lit by an aircraft overhead. The remaining FBI agents, Texas Rangers and Johnson County personnel, gathered at a separate filling station a short distance from where the kidnappers had planned to call. They debated what to do next, since Mr. McNeil had missed the midnight appointment and they had no way of contacting the kidnappers. With few options, investigators decided to send the limousine to the Mount Pleasant gas station late, figuring that the kidnappers would probably call again. We were... Uh pretty well counting on the fact that they were going to show up or call, that you know they were desperate for the money. Uh, we reassured them we had the money, and we certainly reassured them we wanted Amy back. So uh, we thought that they would stay, stay uh, connected to uh, follow through with the payoff site. At approximately 1 a.m., Mr. McNeil and the FBI agents arrived at the Mount Pleasant gas station in the troubled limousine. Almost eight hours and 200 miles after they had first departed Alvarado, the limousine's engine gave out for good. The vehicle wasn't going anywhere without major repair. They could do nothing more but wait in the chilly night and pray that the kidnappers would contact them. Due to the fact that we had to uh, drive very slowly in the limousine, we were, uh, we were late getting to the drop site uh, approximately uh, an hour. Uh, we were somewhat concerned about that, but uh, we set up uh, to wait uh, by the drop site. Texas Rangers kept watch, remaining hidden in the field across from the gas station. The fate of 13-year-old Amy McNeil remained unknown. 
Then, at 1.15 in the morning, the payphone started ringing. As investigators had suspected, one of the kidnappers called back, eager to get the ransom. He claimed that Amy was still alive, but refused to let her speak. Worst still, former Texas Ranger Bill Gunn and his team learned that the assailants had likely spotted the heavy presence of law enforcement on the desolate roads. They started out telling him that he'd brought the police with him, and they were very unhappy with that. So they finally told him to bring the money to a motel in Mount Pleasant. And at that time, he informed the man, the kidnapper, that he could not move the vehicle again. It was dead. And the man told him on the phone then, they said, well, we're coming after the money. And we've got plenty of guns, and there better not be any police officers around. The father remained resolute, despite his fear of what the kidnappers may have already done to his daughter. He grabbed the ransom bag and stood outside so his daughter's captors could see him as they approached. Agents hidden in the limousine readied themselves for an armed confrontation. Retired Special Agent Kicklighter realized a mistake now could cost lives. The exchange of a ransom during a kidnapping is always the, uh, one of the most critical elements of the investigation. In this case, you don't want uh, someone else uh, to be hurt uh, or taken hostage and uh, be a, another victim of a kidnapping. Hours passed in the cold January night. The Rangers stayed alert, protecting against an ambush. On the road circling the gas station, investigators saw no sign of vehicles approaching the ransom drop. See anything out here, uh, By three in the morning, two hours after the kidnappers had called, it looked as if they weren't going to show. The Texas Rangers, Johnson County deputies, and the FBI considered what their next move should be. It was decided that it, they were not going to come, and so the whole uh, surveillance and uh, uh, monitoring situation was called off in anticipation we're going to have to start again the next day on Sunday. Agents in the limo received word of the decision to regroup until daybreak. Mr. McNeil insisted they stay. But investigators convinced him that at present there was nothing more they could do if for his daughter. Money, if nothing else, right? Mr. McNeil was upset that uh, yet another night was going to pass without a resolution to getting his daughter back. Uh, he had done everything that they had told him to do, so there was a great deal of disappointment. A car came by to pick up McNeil and the agents. They headed back to the nearby gas station where others had begun to assemble. The two rangers, hiding in the field for the past three hours, moved toward the street where the sheriff was to meet them in a separate van. As they approached, an unidentified vehicle cruised by their position. It was filled with a group of men and a young girl who headed towards the interstate. Buick southbound. Hi, the rangers you called for units. Need to pick them up. As the they watched those believed to be the kidnappers speed off into the cold Texas night. At 3.45 a.m. on January 13, 1985, two Texas Rangers believed they had spotted the kidnappers of 13-year-old Amy McNeil racing away from the ransom drop point in Mount Pleasant, Texas. Copy me, Mantle, copy. They alerted all available Field, units in the copy. area. En route to collect the Rangers, the Johnson County Sheriff heard their call and saw the suspicious vehicle on the highway. He gave chase, but the sedan easily pulled away from the lumbering van that former Sheriff Eddie Boggs was driving. My van being as slow as it was, they outran me like I was standing still. There wasn't any way I could keep up any, even with inside what was going on because that chase was going over 100 miles an hour, and they were, they were, it was unbelievable. 
Despite his best efforts, the sheriff lost the car and returned to the makeshift command post to provide a detailed account. Amy's life was now in even greater jeopardy since there was no question the kidnappers knew law enforcement was in the area. Then a call came okay. in from their remaining Sounds aircraft. Like we've got someone down Interstate 30, Rangers. The pilot had spotted the vehicle, right, and investigators right. still on the road had resumed the chase. Right Former Texas Ranger Bill Gunn recalls that the suspects were speeding west on Interstate 30. But that time, the rest of us were, had gotten involved, and we were in pursuit of the vehicle. And we continued at a high-speed chase down Interstate 30, to, uh, which would have been a direction going toward Dallas and to a, a small community in another county. Ten minutes later, Texas Rangers, Sheriff deputies, and the FBI fell into line. The suspects refused to slow down. As the lead ranger began to close in, he was fired upon. shotgun and pistol pelted his car with rounds. As he prepared to return fire, he glimpsed two girls in the back seat. One was young Amy McNeil, who they were forcing into the back window. The people who were responsible for this started firing guns at them out the back windows on each side of the Buick. They would push Amy up into the back glass where that she could be seen and of course we couldn't return any fire. Construction narrowed the interstate to one lane, but the suspects did not slip. Shots hit the grill of the lead car. Slugs pierced the carburetor, forcing the ranger to stop. The chase continued at high speeds through three Texas counties before the suspects exited into the small town of Saltillo, Texas. Uh, dispatch, uh, looks like we're slowing down. Unexpectedly, at about 4 a.m., they stopped on the front lawn of a home and several fled on foot. They opened fire on investigators. Two gunmen barricaded themselves behind a van parked in the driveway while a third disappeared behind the house. None of the officers on the scene were wearing body armor. When I first got out of the car, I could see this man standing in front of the van. Now, this is Sunday morning at 4 o'clock, and no moon, as far as I can remember. And uh, every time he'd pull off around with that 12 gauge, he'd line up the world. Investigators took cover behind their vehicles and pinned the gunman down. The suspect's abandoned car was in the direct line of fire. Amy was trapped inside without any means of escape. One assailant attempted to break into the home of an elderly resident. She took cover, not knowing what was happening a few feet from where she had slept. As the firefight raged on, investigators knew that they had to somehow get to Amy McNeil before it was too late. At 4 a.m. on January 13, 1985, the FBI, Texas Rangers, and Johnson County Sheriffs exchanged gunfire with the kidnappers of 13-year-old Amy McNeil. After being held for almost two days, Amy remained trapped inside her captor's vehicle with a female assailant on the front lawn of a farmhouse in Saltillo, Texas. Ranger Sergeant John Dendy was one of several who braved the hail of bullets. I could see one of them behind the front wheel of the car, and that's what I was mainly shooting at. I didn't have any other place to go. And the only thing I knew to do is just shut them down. And the only way I'm going to do that is to hit one of them. Several miles away in another vehicle, Amy's wealthy father was accompanied by the Johnson County Sheriff and an FBI agent on their way to the scene. They could do nothing more but hope and pray that the 13-year-old would survive the battle. Hopefully here, 
here. Go ahead. As the shooting continued, a Johnson County Sheriff's deputy moved towards the suspect's car as Ranger Bill Gunn recalls. One deputy sheriff ran from the vehicle that he arrived in over to the kidnapper's vehicle, and she asked him if he was a police officer, and he said, yes, ma'am, and she just really grabbed hold of him then and hung on. The deputy handed the frightened girl to a ranger who took her out of harm's way. They ran back to the road where more backup arrived. After 44 hours in captivity, 13-year-old Amy McNeil was finally safe. The ranger needed to contact the other investigators and to tell her father the good news. Retired FBI Special Agent Rod Kicklighter was in the vehicle as the ranger's call came through. It seemed like hours before we finally got the confirmation that uh, Amy was safe. I recall Mr. McNeil uh, beating me about the head and shoulders about uh, Amy being safe and they've got her and he was, he was ecstatic, as were we all. Hold your fire! Hold your fire! While Amy was headed to meet her father, the shooting had subsided. The gunmen had both been wounded. Investigators held their weapons on them, not sure if the suspects still had ammunition. Then, out of the shadows, a third gunman emerged. Freeze, get in, get on your knees, get on your knees, drop the weapon. Realizing that escape was impossible, he surrendered. From inside the kidnapper's car, Investigators cuffed the female suspect and a fourth man who had remained there during the shootout. Rangers confirmed with Amy that all the kidnappers were now in custody. On a deserted highway a mile away, Amy ran towards the waiting van that held Mr. McNeil. Former Special Agent Clint Brown watched the reunion between father and daughter. Everybody was pretty emotional, and you know, we all had kids and daughters and such, so we were pretty, uh, pretty emotional just watching that reunion, and, and everyone was so happy that it had turned out so well that we all shared in that uh, excitement and joy of her being recovered safely. No one but the suspects had been hit by gunfire. Both were ex-convicts and high on methamphetamine at the time of the shooting. The elderly resident was also examined. She had survived the ordeal with only frayed nerves. A license plate check on the kidnapper's car revealed that it had been stolen in Dallas the day before. Investigators also figured out why the suspects had stopped their vehicle when they had. We never could understand why they turned in at this particular house. But we found out later they'd run out of gasoline. 34-year-old James Foote, who had made the initial ransom calls, oh. had previously worked for Mr. McNeil and had hatched the plan to kidnap Amy. For using a weapon in the commission of the crime, he was convicted of aggravated kidnapping and attempted murder and was sentenced to life in prison. 27-year-old Michael Mills, who had made the remaining calls, was likewise convicted of aggravated kidnapping and attempted murder, receiving life. The other assailants, 21-year-old Daniel Neckar Jr. and 21-year-old Thomas Barnes, were convicted of the same charges and also sentenced to life. The 18-year-old woman who was with them was charged as the men were. She had only met James Foote a few days earlier before the kidnapping had occurred. The woman was scared when the men brought the 13-year-old into the house, but stayed to prevent Amy from being abused by them. Amy later confirmed that the 18-year-old had protected her, according to retired Johnson County Sheriff Eddie Boggs. She was only given a 10-year probate sentence per Amy's request. The female accomplice really didn't know what she was getting into at the time whenever she joined them, because this 
they had already been using dope for several days steady before she got involved in it. And it was just a, uh, she got involved in something she couldn't get out of. Six months later, on July 4th, 1985, Foote was transferred from the state penitentiary to the Johnson County Jail to face additional charges. Authorities had traced the weapons he used in the kidnapping to the armed home invasion of a Dallas man. Foote was also indicted in Arlington, where he had attempted to kidnap the child of a wealthy developer days before he took Amy. Outside, in the blistering Texas summer, the prison guard agreed to retrieve a water hose to cool down the inmates. When he left, Foote climbed over the eight-foot fence. He made it under the barbed wire. Seconds later, the kidnapper disappeared into the nearby woods. That evening, the Johnson County Sheriff faced the difficult task of informing Mr. McNeil that his daughter's kidnapper had escaped to where no one knew. Deputies would be stationed outside the McNeil home as long as Foote remained at large, fearing that the convict might seek vengeance on the family. Mr. McNeil immediately offered a reward for any information leading to Foote's recapture. A few days later, a call came in to Sheriff Boggs that seemed promising. James Foote had a cousin that lived up close to Paris, Texas that called in and said that he knew where he was and had been in contact with him. And uh, that cousin also had some criminal charges pending on him and was willing to make a deal. Okay, guys, we're going to be entering... Foot had been hiding in the cousin's Paris, Texas home, 170 miles northwest of the prison. Let's gain access to the property. Johnson County deputies prepared for the here. assault of the single-story dwelling. Over here. This is your living room area they here. readied themselves for another armed confrontation. As promised, the cousin made certain that Foote was inside at home for the arrest to take place. Deputy Sheriff, freeze! Get your hand up, your this hand. time, there would be no shootout. Sheriff deputies okay. captured Foote okay. without okay. incident. He was returned to prison where Foote will spend the rest of his life. At the state capitol in Austin, Texas, retired Ranger Sergeant John Dendy was among those who received commendation and recognition for the successful conclusion to the case. Going to Austin, talking to the governor, getting a commendation. The fact that I knew that I had had something to do with saving this beautiful little girl's life it was worth more than anything else they could do. That made everything worthwhile. All the 36 years that I spent in law enforcement, that, that, was, the, that was the top. Because law enforcement responded quickly and did not relent, Amy McNeil was reunited with her family and friends thankful for the determined officers and agents who answered the call.